I would like to thank the organizers for the invitation to present work we're doing in our uh, nutrition and metabolism section. So my talk today will be about the interplay between diet, the microbiome and cancer risk. So first I will try to explain a bit the evidence on diet and cancer risk. Then I will also talk about the human microbiome and cancer risk the interplay between diet, microbiome, and cancer risks. And then at the end, I will give you some limitations and barriers we have to deal with and some future perspectives. So when I want to say something about diet and cancer risk, then one of the important projects that's currently ongoing and that has been already referred to by uh, Dr. Herrero, the previous speaker, is uh, the World Cancer Research Fund Continuous Update Project. So this is a very important project to collect rigorous and systematic uh, evidence um, and to kind of create a, a scientific resource that allows us to come up with the most up-to-date information for reducing cancer risk based upon diet, nutrition and physical activity. So basically the Continuous Update Project runs continuously and all the time looks at new evidence coming up in the literature. And it's just run from 2007 to 2018 to publish the third expert report, which was called Diet, Nutrition, Physical Activity and Cancer, a Global Perspective. So as you can see, it takes a huge amount of time to uh, extract all the data from this evidence and to come up with public health recommendations. So here you can see the most important information in this report summarized. So I just made a selection of some important cancers that are related with uh, diet, nutrition and physical activity. So as you can see in this matrix, that's how WCF publishes uh, the evidence, how diet and uh, lifestyle factors are related to cancer risk. So if you look, for instance, at colorectal cancer, then you can clearly see that a lot of dietary factors are related to colorectal cancer risk. For instance, whole grain consumption is clearly related to colorectal cancer risk. So there's clear convincing evidence or um, probable uh, convincing evidence that whole grains are an important uh, protective factor for colorectal cancer. The red ones are showing convincing increased risks in getting the cancer. So as you can see, for instance, alcohol drinks are related to many cancers. And as you can see here also, the adult body fatness, as Dr. Weiderpass was already referring to as well, is also related to many uh, cancer outcomes. So based upon all this evidence, WCRF is able to publish some uh, recommendations, some global recommendations, and they came up in the latest report with 10 recommendations. So these 10 recommendations include, uh, for instance, to keep a healthy body weight, to be more active, to consume more uh, fruits and vegetables, to drink less alcohol. They also don't recommend uh, dietary supplements. They prefer to go for the balanced uh, diet. Women delivering babies are recommended to breastfeed the baby for their own health and also for the baby's health. And then also the consumption of fast foods should be limited, energy uh, rich foods. Also the consumption of meat and red meat and processed meat should be limited and the consumption of sugar sweetened drinks should also be limited. For cancer survivors they currently re uh, recommend very similar recommendations. Now the evidence go fast and so in the meantime while the WCRF is continuing doing these uh, updates there's new evidence coming up and one of the interesting projects that was recently published in the BMG is on um, the consumption of ultra processed foods and when I speak about ultra processed foods I'm not only talking about energy dense foods but also about uh, soft drinks that have artificial sweeteners that do not necessarily have high energy contents but that are industrially processed and that may also uh, increase certain risks 
So here you can see the study from uh, colleagues in, uh, in France who looked at the consumption of ultra-processed foods and the proportion of ultra-processed food in the diet in relation to all cancers. And what came out of this study was a 10% increase in the proportion of ultra-processed foods in our diet was associated with a significant increase of more than 10% in overall and in breast cancer risk. So if we continue to consume and to increase the consumption of uh, ultra-processed food, we may really drive an increasing cancer burden in the next decades. So then, what about the human microbiome and cancer risk? So as you know, our body is uh, colonized by many, micro many microbiotes, and so here I wanted to present the general patterns in the consumption of bacterial communities in various body habitats. So our body has about uh, 1.3 microbial cells for every human cell, and these are very highly metabolically active. Um, so the microbiota are variable over time, and in general we hope to have a symbiosis, but very often we can come to dysbiosis because of reasons I will explain later on. So here you can see that depending on the body habitat, we may have a completely different uh, composition of the microbiome. So recently, we conducted a systematic review to look at what literature was already published uh, looking at the human microbiome and cancer risk. So a lot of publications have been published and when selecting the, the high quality studies, we ended up with 56, uh, 56 studies that looked at the human microbiome and cancer risk, from which one cohort study and 55 case control studies. So as you can see from this summary table, most of the work done was from the gut microbiome in relation to colorectal cancer risk. So we had 27 publications looking at the gut microbiome and the risk for colorectal cancer. And then we also had some publications on the bile duct uh, microbiome, uh, cervical microbiome, esophageal microbiome, castric, laryngeal, the lung microbiome, the oral one, that was compared to many, several cancers, and then also the urine microbiome in relation to breast cancer risk. So here I want to present you the results for the gut microbiome and cancer risk, colorectal cancer risk, for which we had the highest amount of studies. And some of these studies were using fecal samples, while others are using uh, mucosal biopsies. And as you can see, um, so the red arrows are showing an increased colorectal cancer risk compared to the controls. The green ones are showing a decreased colorectal cancer risk versus controls. So most of the ones presented here, and it's quite comparable between fecal samples and mucosal biopsies, are uh, in favor of colorectal cancer, while the species ruminococcus demonstrates a, decreased, a potential decreased risk in colorectal cancer. Then which is also important is the biodiversity. So in the microbiome, we call it the alpha diversity. It's kind of the number of species that are available in the in the sample, and most of the studies that we found are showing a clear decreased cancer risk with more numbers of species, so with more higher alpha diversity, except from few cancers, which is, for instance, for cervical cancer. So when talking about microbiome and cancer risk, I don't want you to read necessarily this slide, but we just want to show you the complexity of how the microbiome may be related to cancer risk, and it may be related in different stages of uh, cancer development. So the initiation, the promotion, the progression, and even the response therapy might be, might be influ influenced by the microbiome. So it's very difficult to study the relationship because we have a lack of studies on human microbiota uh, other than the gut microbiome. Uh, we definitely lack large-scale cohort studies, and we need more uniform, uh, standardized methods. And also we need studies where we can correct for uh, confounding factors, since the microbiome and also cancer are related to so many environmental factors 
uh, genetic factors that it's very difficult to disentangle these uh, relationships. So now that I have shown you the link between diet and cancer and the microbiome and cancer, we're wondering what might be the interplay between diet and the microbiome and the relationship between the three of them. So from studies looking into uh, the diet in the past years, a nice publication was showing how the microbiome has changed over the, over the centuries. And you can see at times when people were still consuming remote, remote hunter-gatherer population, uh, people were having still a very diverse uh, microbiome. When people started getting a diet uh, from a traditional farming and fishing population, they still had quite a high uh, diversity in the microbiome. But nowadays, when we come to the Western urban industrialized population, we can see that the diversity in the microbiome is far much lower. Also, in a very recent study conducted by our PhD student, Sylvia Pisanu, in the northern Finland birth cohort, we can clearly see that uh, the alpha diversity is inversely related to the PMI of people in this uh, birth cohort. So you can see the obese people have clearly a lower alpha diversity than the normal weight uh, people. So when using the BMI as a kind of a surrogate for our lifestyle and our nutrition habits, then we can see that indeed um, people with worse dietary habits may have lower alpha diversity. So from the slides you've seen so far, we already can clearly see that there may be an interplay between all these different concepts. So WCF clearly was sh showing a relationship between diet and cancer. We could also see from the systematic review a relationship between the microbiome and cancer. And from history, we can clearly see that there is also a relationship between the diet and the microbiome, potentially giving opportunities for future prevention strategies. So when we speak about the interplay of the diet with the gut microbiome, it's quite a complex uh, pool of different mechanisms. So we have the dietary and digestive components that then uh, react with the gut microbiota, and the gut microbiota, they create kind of postbiotics, which are metabolites that may influence cancer. So for instance, oncogenic uh, dietary components may be metabolized in oncometabolites, while other uh, polyphenols, for instance, may also uh, react with the gut microbiota and may allow the creation of short-chain fatty acids, which may be just protective for certain cancers, and particularly for colorectal cancer. So depending on the diet we have and many other factors, we may end up in two different uh, scenarios. One is the symbiosis and homeostasis of the microbiota, versus the dysbiosis, where there's clearly a problem uh, that uh, microbiota are not anymore in the, in the homeostasis. So dietary factors like fiber, uh, short-chain fatty acids, also certain vitamins, uh, the omega-6 versus omega-3 ratio, they all may influence our microbiome composition. And depending on the diet, you may end up in a symbiosis or rather in a dysbiosis of the colorectal microbiome. A nice study that got a lot of attention in 2015 is this one, uh, where Keith Kiefer wanted to do a tr an intervention study with a two weeks food exchange between African Americans and rural Africans. So Kiefer uh, gave the African-Americans uh, who were normally consuming a typical westernized diet, a high-fiber, low-fat African-style diet, while the rural Africans were given a high-fat, low-fiber Western-style diet. So we already knew from beforehand that col colorectal cancer rates were much higher in the African-Americans than in the rural South Africans. As you can see, 65 uh, over one, 100,000 versus less than five over 100,000 in uh, rural South Africa. So the authors wanted to know what could be the reason and could potentially uh, the diet be involved. And so what came out of their study 
was that indeed after this only two week change, they could already see uh, changes in the mucosal biomarkers that are related normally to cancer risk and also in aspects of the microbiota and the metabolome known uh, that affect cancer risk. Like for instance, the beta rate uh, was increased and there was a decrease of the secondary bile acids which are known to uh, be a risk factor for cancer. So there seems to be clearly an interplay between these three different concepts. Now, it's very hard to uh, study all these relationships, and this is just a slide that I wanted to show you for the discussion also, because it demonstrates all the confusion that there is in the literature today, and as you can see, depending on the study design we are using, we may end up with completely different conclusions. So why do we have all these conflicting findings? And when looking into diet, then diet is a very complex factor that uh, is a lifetime exposure, so difficult to know what time window should we focus on. Uh, we have a large within and between person variability, and we, we, we don't really know is it foods to look at, dietary patterns, or the components, the nutrients. We even don't know whether we already know all the components in the diet. Um, so many of them may be also intercorrelated. They may have antagonistic and synergistic uh, effects. There's also a role of the genetic variation that is still largely unknown. And it's very difficult to measure this dietary intake, given also that the food supply is changing all the time as well. So it's really challenging to investigate this interplay between the diet, microbiome, and cancer risk. So you've seen on the previous slide already many challenges for dietary intake assessments, but we have very similar challenges when looking into the microbiome measurements, where you also have high within and between person vari variation. Uh, we don't know exactly the role of genetics, changes with age and lifestyle, and environmental factors. Uh, also, still many questions regarding the methods we have to use. Although we have lots of challenges, there's also opportunities. And as Dr. Herrero already was mentioning in the previous slides and also previous speakers, so there are opportunities like frameworks, like the organized cancer screening programs, where also Dr. Weiderpass was referring to, that may potentially create opportunities for disentangles this interplay between diet and even other lifestyle factors, the microbiome and, um, and cancer risk further. Uh, so we are now, with Dr. Gunther, our section head, we are trying to investigate to what extent the FIT test, as already mentioned by Dr. Weiderpas as well, so a simple fecal test that is being used for the colorectal cancer screening, so to what extent can we still use this fecal sample to look into the microbiome and to disentangle further how the microbiome may be related uh, to cancer risk, but also how lifestyle factors, if we also ask questionnaires from uh, these people, how may this all be related and how can we then come up with further evidence-based and maybe tailored prevention strategies? So we probably need an integrated approach in the organized uh, screening programs or other frameworks that may be available. So I'd like to thank my colleagues and particularly also Dr. Smeloff here today for the nice collaborations that we are doing together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, questions uh, to the speaker. Uh, my impression is that, uh, or, or if, if I am wrong, you correct me, please, the uh, reproducibility of studies are quite low, yeah? Results, reproducibility of uh, results are low. Yeah, the reproducibility for the microbiome we're currently still uh, looking at, but indeed that's also an important problem that we, we don't know yet how reproducible it is, and studies are really contradictory in this regard. Yeah. And how we can affect only by manipulation of diet? Excuse me, how? How can we 
influence the microbiome by manipulation of diet, by changing the diet, or yeah, by yeah, this would potentially be the idea indeed. As we can see, that we progress to a lower diversity of the microbiome, and that this goes with also potentially a lower diversity in our diet. We now want to look in into what extent can either certain dietary factors or maybe just more diversity in our diet uh, improve the microbiome diversity and maybe also decrease cancer risk. Okay, thank you. Вопрос есть еще? У меня есть вопрос. I have a question. So, what shall we do um, with all this um, uh, with all this uh, probiotics looking products in the supermarkets? Shall we run to buy them and consume to change the microbiome or keep it like it is? Mm. What would you, I mean, it's like more theoretical question, of course, but yeah. what would you? Yeah, thank you. I think it's a very relevant question because as I have shown, the WCRF is definitely not recommending dietary supplements and not neither nutraceuticals and even we may take risk when using fortified foods because our body aims at homeostasis and symbiosis. And as also Dr. Herrero said, when we start uh, manipulating through medication or through supplements our homeostasis, we may end up with dysbiosis and uh, create other problems or even more problems. So because of this reason, for healthy people, I'm not speaking about pathologies, but for healthy people, we don't really uh, recommend um, supplements or um, special industrially processed productions because we just don't know yet what the impact is and normally a varied diet, a variety of diets should probably be the best recommendation. Thank you so much.